computer. Okay, let's hope it works. Let me know when you want me to record my stuff. Uh, go, go ahead. Okay, I am now recording. Okay. All right, well, let's get started. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining for this uh, special exclusive, not quite exclusive, actually, my <laughs> guess is uh, doing the, the Kickstarter round, uh, going everywhere, asking any streamers and podcaster if they are keen to hear about his project. And uh, I encourage all of you, uh, if you have a stream or a podcast, do uh, invite Michael uh, to your podcast. Michael, could you briefly introduce yourself? Let, let's let's picture, I, I don't know, yeah, People might not be familiar with who you are, despite well, me being well, quite familiar. Let's start by saying that, that, yes, I'm going to any and every podcaster who will have me, but yours is the one I really wanted to do. So this is the, this is the one that excites me the most. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, the, actually, I need to remember. So I need to... Uh, I think I committed to interviewing somebody else, but actually I'm I'm not doing online interviews anymore. So, but I'm I'm very very happy to to indulge you with this one. So, that's the return, the brief return of Cafe Rollist for for people uh, out there. Technically, I'm unemployed again, so I should be back recording more of these. But uh, <laughs> well, technically, I'm not unemployed at the moment. It's complicated. Yeah, people not from it's the UK. There's a lot of technicalities. Yeah, in that. Yeah, people can Google zero hour contract. It's delightful. But <laughs> let's go into the the fantasy world. Oh, is it fantasy actually? Uh, let's go to the action world of Action Twelve Cinema. What's your game, Michael? And uh, but yeah. you didn't even introduce yourself. I, yeah, actually, I asked you. I, I've already sidetracked you. So again, so I'm Michael. I am the host of the RPG Academy podcast. Some of you may have heard it for a while. Caleb's show was actually part of a network that I had put together of a bunch of shows that I really liked. Um, we didn't really do enough to justify being a network any longer, so that went away. But uh, I'm very pleased to have gotten to know Caleb over those years. And I'm still a faculty a member. And, Correct. You still put film studies out regularly. Name. I record a show for the RPG Academy, even if it's not mentioned in annual summaries. Apparently, well, <laughs> you no, know, that was an oversight on my part. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely appreciate what you have done and what you continue to do uh, with your show, and then how it overlaps with ours. So I, I truly am a fan of what you, you do, and I really am honored to be here. Uh, so I've been podcasting for like twelve years. We have tons and tons of different shows we started our own convention and i've been the main organizer of that for many years and action 12 cinema is cinema is my first attempt at actually producing my own game your game uh paris gondo or paris is it is it supposed to be marie it's gondo it's, it's no it's paris it's paris okay i didn't know if it was supposed to be like a pronunciation I know, of a terrible I, I know american that. accent when I picked the name of the game, I was just like, I wanted a gender neutral uh, first name. So I told Paris, like Paris of Troy or Paris Hilton or Paris in Gilmore Girls, if there are yep. any fans out there. I'm a uh, fan. And, <laughs> and I wanted something to sound slightly like Marie Kondo. But it's funny. Yeah, yeah the, the the English audience uh, often are like, oh, actually, it's 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 Harry. Harry. I'm like, yeah. okay, if you want, but actually, no. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, but yeah, your game was a, was a kind of an inspiration as well. I had already been working on mine, but it, you know, it, Action Twelve Cinema truly started as a joke. Like it started as just sort of like a, I'm going to get people to roll a bunch of d12s because I think it'll be funny. And then over time, it kind of evolved into an actual game that's actually fun to play. And then again, you having success with your game kind of inspired me to like, you know what, let's let's do this. Let's make it a real thing. And I'm very excited to say that Action Film Cinema is an actual game now. Like it still needs work. I'm, I need to do one more writing pass. It's going to need additional layout and editing. I've been um, getting art for, I've been commissioning art and the art needs to be included in the layout. But uh, it's an actual game that you can actually play. And it's actually a lot of fun, if I do say so myself. It's funny that you pick the D12, which is not the best game uh, dice at all. Unlike the D10 it or the actually is the it is actually the best die. It is it is objectively the best polyhedral. <laughs> All right. Well, you you sort of uh, jumped or well, actually, let's start with this. You're stuck in the elevator with someone, hopefully someone you think might be interested in role playing game. What's your elevator pitch? Well, you've got like five minutes. Very. Right. 
punch, a punchy uh, summary of what it is. So the, so the super short like tagline edition is Action 12 Cinema is B-movie action, D-12 dice. The slightly longer version is if you've ever played in a role-playing game, like a traditional RPG, like D&D, maybe Pathfinder, where when you do something really cool, usually kill a monster and the DM lets you as a player have narrative control. And they go, okay, Caleb, tell me what it looks like when you kill the orc. I took that part of the game and made that the entire game. So you have complete narrative control at all times as the player to describe exactly what your character is doing in the most cool, over-the-top, action-oriented way you want. And all of that is actually true. You don't have to roll to see if you did that. You did that. The dice just determine if that actually helped or not. So you pick the cherry on top of the cake and you made a big pile of cherries, which you picked yes. from all the cakes together. So the, it's all not, cherries. It's, oops, nothing but cherries. <laughs> Brilliant. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it's GMless, it's no prep, correct, and it's correct. short format. Uh, something in common with Paris Gondo, the life saving magic of inventoring. Uh, tell us a bit more about that. GMless, for instance, uh, I mean, uh, you do a lot of actual play, but I would have assumed that, like me, to be honest, you are not so much into GMless game. I was a bit surprised that you, you took that path. Uh, so yeah, why it... and how? So it evolved over time. It wasn't always a GMless game. And that actually kind of solidified fairly recently. Uh, and I'll be honest, part of that was a marketing decision that I felt like, because like this isn't a game that's going to take over a campaign. No one's going to leave D&D for this. No one's going to leave Pathfinder for this. No one's going to leave Call of Cthulhu for this. This is a game that you play once every now and then with your friends or your game group because someone else can't be there. The GM can't run that night. Maybe you're at a convention. Uh, it lends itself to really silly kind of humorous play. So it's not a campaign replacement game. And then since I know that's what it's for, I just said, well, let's just go all the way. And that way you don't have to have anyone with the responsibility of being a GM. It's just the, the game does most of the work for you. And then as players, you all kind of share, because that's what GMless means. It doesn't really mean GMless. It means share GM. When it's my term and I'm the GM, when you're, it's your turn, you're the GM. But the game provides all the prompts necessary so that no one is responsible for trying to craft a story or craft NPCs or a plot that makes any bit of sense. So it's it, it reduces that workload, puts it on the game itself. So you can just focus on having a good time. You don't have to have any anxiety. Uh, one of the things that has kind of come out of the development of the game, and I've talked about this on my podcast quite a lot. I struggle with how to give advice on how to become a better GM in certain avenues. I think imp improvisation training outside of just going to an improv class, like actually going and paying someone to put you through an improv class. It's hard to teach other people how to be better at that. You just, you do it. And over time you'll get better at it. This does that. Like this is absolutely a GM training mechanism that if you play this game, because you are kind of the GM for little segments of time as it moves around the table, it should help you get more comfortable doing those sorts of things. So if you're thinking about being a GM, but you're not sure, this would be a great game to play a couple of times and it's going to help, help you be better at it. Great. Well, actually, you know, I, I was reading a, a few of your recent comments and the description of the game. And uh, I thought I played this game, but I think when I played, there was a facilitator, okay, okay, mm. Game Master, and I think you had it cards as well. So, yeah, do, do you remember when I played? And so what are the changes since then? Uh? Yeah, yeah. Again, it is there were and and most of that is still there. Like like if you follow the the genealogy, like the DNA of the game you played is absolutely still in there. But it has gotten better. It has gotten tighter. It has gotten just more mechanically solid, svelte. Um, so originally it was a GM game, but again, it, it, I'll be honest. Part of that was a marketing decision of like this feels a niche now. Like a GMless game is a different. Com competition than other games so then i'm really only competing with, against other gmless games type of a thing but it also it doesn't need a gm like the 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 game does so much lifting for you if you still want to be the gm like if you want to be one the game will let you there's nothing in this game that says you can't have someone who kind of takes on the main role of a facilitator it's just not necessary and um 
part of the cards decision was also a marketing decision that, uh, as you may know, as someone who's now produced a, a game that you've sold, if it's just a book, that's a different mailing rate, at least in the US. I don't exactly know if it's the same where you live, but here we have something called media mail. And if you're I, just- I, I, could, I could go that today. Someone was telling me to check it out and I was like, oh, actually making cards was a poor decision because then it's not a US media. It drastically anymore. changes shipping rates. Yeah, it absolutely drastically changes your shipping rate. So I can mail my book for like four or five dollars, maybe upwards of six. It depends on, you know, the market fluctuates and how big and thick, whatever. But if I make cards also, that's a completely different thing. It doesn't fall under media mail and it's a lot more expensive. So there's a part of me that still thinks the card idea would be fun, rather, you know, shuffling cards and dealing out rather than using D12 tables. But it functions the same way. Mm -hmm. You're randomly generating elements that you use to create the story of the movie that you're in. But in my current way, you use the D12 and the other way you use a deck of cards. So I have thought about maybe doing that as like a add on extra thing. You can do like a print on demand drive through RPG thing, but it doesn't need them. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's a cleaner product without them. It's a yeah, you know, yeah, okay. streamlined. No, it's funny because when I played it, there were no cards. Then I heard of cards and now, from what you say, We're I back, get yeah. that they're yeah. not cards anymore, they're which no cards is a anymore. good yeah. idea. My next game won't have any cards. Paris going to do it's much better <laughs> with cards, so I'm, I'm going ahead with it. But uh, poor design decision, <laughs> so I do recommend designers out there uh, to avoid it. Uh, well, thank you very much for mentioning Paris Gondo as a, an inspiration, but uh, absolutely was. I mean, you've been interviewing so many game designers, I would expect you have better inspiration than another podcaster who's doing. <laughs> His very first game, so well, no, uh, because that's I, that's who I'm comparing myself to. I'm not Watsy. I'm not Cobalt Press. I'm not you know Pazo. I'm a guy who podcasts and tinkers with games. And I saw someone like you take an idea that you know <laughs> there's there's definitely some similarities between if the this games. idiot I mean, can do it. Why can't I? <laughs> exactly? If that idiot can do it, this idiot can do it. He doesn't even speak English properly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, neither do I. So again, I'm from Kentucky, so we have that in common as well. All right. But yeah, there, there are no other inspiration in terms of system or people you interviewed, which because I know like uh you know, interacting with designers, myself as a podcaster was a big drive for me to create my game. And then uh there are games like Baron and Chosen by James Wallis, which were direct inspiration for it. Uh did did yourself have other inspirations uh, besides uh uh Bozo in London, huh? Yeah, so the two big games that I think it it definitely has a lineage to is a uh, Wushu and Fiasco. Uh, Cause Fiasco is basically a game about playing a movie. That's sort of like a, a drama where things are going to go terrible and action 12 cinema is playing through a movie with over the top silly action. So there's definitely some similarity there and overlap, but we, one we use D 12s, which is again, it's an objectively superior die choice. Um, and then Wushu where you get, you get sort of, uh, a benefit, the more descriptive you are, the more dice you get. And that that doesn't work the same in my game, but you can just describe things in the most over the top way you want. And it just happens. So the game is more fun, the more over the top action you describe something. Happen. Like you could say, you know, I, I drive through traffic, I, I pull off at the exit and I get out and I go into the diner. Or you can talk about how you weave in and out of traffic and you run red lights and people are crashing behind you and you know you do donuts in the parking lot and you get out and you throw your jacket over your shoulder and you light a you know match off the, the stubble on your chin and you light your cigar as you come in. Like you can just fulfill that sort of fantasy of the most epic description at all times. And whatever you say happened, happened. The, the dice do not determine if you actually do what you said. That happens. The dice determine if what you said happens actually helped propel the story forward or not. I no, no, I want to, to do a hack would be mundane 12 cinema, which is you try <laughs> to describe things in the most mundane way and you, you end up with a type of ascendance, uh, very artsy, but very... Uh, uh, street level type uh, of uh, I think that game adventure. would use d4s that sounds like a d4 game to me oh yeah <laughs> mundane four cinema uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I believe you you structure your game into phases uh, mm -hmm. or what are those two phases and how does that work 
So you have what's called the pre-production phase again, because I'm I'm trying to lean in lean into the movie lingo. So the pre-production phase. Do you have is a where... budget? Do you have to convince execs? Uh, is it Netflix so, and they're not going to renew you? There's no hard mechanic for that, but that is some of the conversation that can come out during the game. Is like, is this a low budget movie? Is it high budget? Do we do we have a CGI budget, or are we going to literally have a person in a rubber mask? Like those are the kind of things that will come out in play. But there isn't a budget deciding role for the game but that is part of the conversation but so pre-production is where you create uh the basic outline of the movie you pick the genre and and the, all the charts that you roll on are all inspirational only they're never restrictive so if you don't like a result you can just ignore it you can re-roll you can just make up your own on the spot uh kind of the way the book is written is that whoever's rolling the die is what we call the active player because it's gmless so you share the gm responsibility so if there needs to be a tiebreaker, the person who rolled the result is the ultimate decider. So if there is a conflict and like, well, half the people want to do it and half don't, whoever rolled is the deciding factor. It almost never, in fact, I don't think it's ever has came up, but that's in there just in case. Uh, but you're going to decide the genre of your movie. You're going to decide sort of the overall plot. Like what, what is this about? Is it a, a disaster movie? Is it about the weather out of control? Is it about um, a heist? Is it about a sentient AI trying to take over the world? And there's a, just a bunch of different options. Most of them can be very broadly interpreted because that's kind of the benefit is that you can take what the book tells you and you can apply it to the other decisions you've already made to make it kind of massage it into making sense. Uh, then you, you roll a number of obstacles and these are very, again, broadly defined things that your characters need to overcome. It can be like finding a person, ticking time bomb, sentient AI, fight, which just means you got some sort of conflict between two horses. And then you kind of organize those into a loose structure of our movie. Like this is what happens in act one. This is what's going to happen in act two. This is what's going to happen in act three. Oh, I like and you that. Can you can throw them out at any time. And like we played last night, a just for fun game. And it absolutely, we started with AI, like artificial intelligence. And then halfway through the game, it morphed into ALF. I don't know if you're familiar with the old TV show from the 80s. So it became ALF intelligence. So rather than fighting a computer, we were fighting multiple ALFs. There was an Alpha ALF. And if we killed the Alpha ALF, it killed all the other ALFs. So our movie was called Alpha Omega. Again, that's that's the way the game works. Like if you find that in any ways like silly and like tongue in cheek kind of humorous, you're getting what this this game is about. Those are the types of games you play through. But But you basically do all that setup first then you create your characters and then you interact with the rules using a simple D12 dice pool system. Everyone takes turn being the active player. You describe whatever you want. You try to overcome the obstacles. And as you progress through the movie to your final climatic big boss battle. I really like this idea of having a face because, you know, I mentioned earlier that I designed also a GMless game, but I'm not the biggest fan of GMless game. It's not a crit as I've said that a million times now, but it's not a criticism of GMless game at all. Right. It's just a question of taste and uh, no later than uh, today at lunch. Uh, I was talking about that. Uh, that's designed by committee and that reminds me of my work. So, mm -hmm. but I do like GMless or multi game master uh, games which are very structured. So there's this real middle, uh, beginning, a middle, uh, an end, which mm -hmm. is there, there's a framework, and then you, you play within that. And there's, there's not this difficulty of sticking the landing, you know, right. uh, your uh, superhero landing in this case. <laughs> so, I, but I, re I really like, so I played game, which is, there's a predefined structure you follow, that's how Paris Gondor works. But I really like this idea of that, actually you're gonna have this pre-production phase in which you're gonna define the structure with the other players but it's it's nice because there's a of course you can change it from from what you're telling me but uh there's both a a agreement over what the structure should or could be and then uh there's a buy-in and and people are aware of what the structure so in terms of improv it's interesting that a framework is agreed upon, defined together, right. and then this is, this is being fleshed out as part of mm -hmm. the, the next phase of the game. Huh? Right. I mean, if you ever go to an improv show, it's always like, give me a profession, give me a location, and then they improv. Giving those slight 
guidelines help focus the story and, and the restrictions can also sometimes kind of open you up to possibilities that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And that's exactly what this, this is very much an improv game. We're giving you just enough of a loose structure so that you don't just sit there going, well, I can do anything. So I don't guess I'll do anything. Like it, you have, you know, too many options. So you have no options. So we're giving you a, a structure to play within, but you can ignore it. And it, it happens like, like in last night, we, we completely halfway through one of the acts, we're like, okay, we're, we're changing it. it. It was an AI and now it's ALF. And you just write that up to this being a bad movie. It was a bad script. Like we used the first draft of the script on day one and we used the third draft of the script on day two and no one caught that they didn't make sense. And in then editing, we never explain the difference and and anytime that happens you just roll it into well this is a bad movie that's why that happened it wasn't our fault you know and you can do things on the meta level like i'm terrible at accents as as everyone knows i barely speak english but sometimes i'll try to do an accent so if i start with an accent and then i just can't keep it up maybe we changed actors like maybe that's why i can't do the same actor accents i'm literally a different person in the next scene so it works on a meta level sometimes i, I pretend i'm the director and i'll throw out like direction to the other characters and they can feel free to ignore them because there's no GM, but th the game works very much like an improv show where we're tagging off of each other. We're giving each other suggestions. We're using some, we're ignoring the others. We're wrapping those into something else. Uh, if that sounds like fun, this is a game that facilitates that type of fun. And for me, I find that very fun. I thought you were about to say you're doing it right. <laughs> you're doing it right if you're having fun. Yeah, I've heard that somewhere. Before. You need to, if I may make a suggestion, if it's not already there, sorry if it's too soon for uh, fans of DC Comics out there, but uh, maybe if the movie is bad or just if it suits you, uh, there should be a chance to not releasing the movie uh, in order <laughs> to recover tax revenues or exactly. whatever happened yes. over there. Uh, does that mean in the... Have you... Does phase one is informed or structured in any way by, I don't know, a three-act structure or hero's yes. journey or... Yeah, so everything goes into a three-act structure. Perfect, uh, great. Very loosely defined. So so when you roll your obstacles, you, you roll six, and then you decide as a group, which is the first obstacle in act one? What is our inciting incident? You pick two, that will be in act two, and then you pick three, that will be in act three. So you have your inciting incident, you have your uh, rising tension, and then you'll have your final uh, climax and then denouement in your third act. So it follows the very general structure of a three-act story. Again, you can ignore that, but that's the way the game sets it out to start with. Now, during the game, if you roll really badly, which you shouldn't do. The, the math is heavily in your favor. This is an action story. You're going to win. Your characters don't die unless you really want them to. But sometimes the math is just against you. You're just bad, having a bad day and you roll really, really poorly. You can create new obstacles or you can make the obstacles you're in more difficult than they need to be. So you're in the middle of a car chase and you roll poorly. Maybe you get into an accident and then you got to switch cars and the bad guy got further away. Or maybe two people are chasing the same person and then they get in front of you. Uh, and now you have to get out and have a fight and beat them up and then the person's getting further away the whole time so the game works where you have these sort of like mini setbacks or these many mini incremental advances so that you can kind of tell the story in chunks uh so that kind of makes sense and it doesn't always that's part of the game um but th to me that's what i find fun I, and i'm jumping around a little bit but i talk about how this is a good game for like training you to be a gm so this is what i mean by that so let's say that our obstacle is a car chase or it'll be in the game it would just be a chase you could say it's a car chase if you so want to now we're talking phase two right production yeah yes yeah so now we're in phase two so we're, so one of our obstacles was chase we have decided that, that is a car chase for our movie purposes and we are going to start with a car chase so you might imagine if you've watched a lot of action movies you've probably seen this and particularly like, like american tv action movies where um, someone like a police officer will hold up a badge in the gun and they'll stop some random civilian and take their car. And now they're driving after the person they were chasing. They're weaving in and out of traffic. Maybe they run some red lights and the cars that were going on green have to stop, or maybe they hit each other. And in, in the rear view mirror, you see the accidents piling up behind you. Uh, you get up, even with the person, you start ramming your car into their car and you try to get them to run off the road and they run into a big bunch of barrels filled with water on the interstate. And there's like this big plume of a thing. You've probably seen that in dozens and dozens of movies. So in my game, if that's happening, you can describe all of that. And then you roll at the end and that determines whether or not 
you have successfully ended that obstacle. But where the game becomes fun and interesting for me is you could determine, you could decide to roll at any point in that series of, of uh, options. And that kind of gives you different avenues for how you explore the improv. So you might roll at the very beginning when you're holding up your gun and your badge and you're trying to get a car. And if you roll really well, maybe you narrate, oh, well, I got like into a GT Mustang. This is like a muscle car. So I've got a lot of power. So I'm gonna be able to chase this guy down. And if you roll poorly, maybe the only schmuck who stopped was on a moped. And so now you're like, me, 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 you know, running through the city is like two miles an hour. There's people walking faster than you. It's a driving or, school, like in the, the naked gun and you're, you're not even behind the wheel. Uh... Yeah, exactly. You get in there and the other person's driving. Uh, maybe you, you get into the Mustang and you're going, you're weaving through traffic and that's when you roll. And if you roll well, you weave through traffic and all the accidents are in your re rearview mirror. If you roll poorly, you get into an accident and now maybe the Mustang is totaled and now you get onto the moped or into a, you know, a beat em up pickup truck that doesn't go fast. So every place along that story, you decide when you roll and it, the earlier you roll, the more options it gives you for how you narrate what those results mean. Because the way the mechanic, the mechanics are super simple, but there is a mechanic to the system where each obstacle has a value and you take your successes in a, you know, apply them against that value. And once that value has dropped to zero, you have successfully completed that obstacle. So if you narrate that you chase the person down and run them off the road, and then you roll, but you don't roll well enough to complete the obstacle, the obstacle's not over. So you have to then explain, well, how did I not do the thing that I just said I did? And it could be, well, you got the wrong car. Or, you know, you've probably seen in a movie where the guy's like, I'm sorry, he paid me a thousand dollars to do this. And the person you're after actually switched cars and you didn't notice it. So there's different ways to apply the results to make it make sense. But the earlier in the story you roll, the more options you have. And that's why I say it's like a GM training tool, because when that kind of opens up your mind of each spot along the narration, I could roll and I could interpret success this way and failure this way. That's exactly what a GM does in the game. You, you set up the obstacle, the players roll, and they roll really well. Well, how do you keep the story rolling or going with a good roll? And how do you keep the story going with a, with a bad roll? So this game, and it's not unique, but this game does allow you to kind of stretch those GM muscles. And I think it would make you a better GM to play it. Yeah, I'm a big advocate of people playing uh, different games, not necessarily specific games that I personally like, but trying different games. Because even if you're, let's say your main game is uh, uh, the big D and the D, it still can inform your your game mastering or your, mm -hmm. or your play. And I, I really like this. Oh, your game sounds like it could encourage people to interpret failures in a different fashion. I remember we recorded an episode about that. I'm not sure if I was a guest or if I just listened to to that episode. I think it was from a, an Academic Online uh, panel. But the, the idea that a failure, for instance, on uh, I don't remember what it's called in D and D, but uh, trying to up, unlock a door, uh, a mm -hmm. TV check of some kind, uh, rather than the failure being ah. Uh, you didn't open the door. That's it. It could be, well, you're trying to open the door, but you fail. Actually, it makes a lot of noise and uh, some militia overhears you and you open the door, right. but the militia shows up on the, you know, the, the other side of the door and they're like, well, what's going on over here? What, what's the sound? So you, you f sort of fail forward, but interesting yep. things happen or you you fail to open the door but a militia show up or you're trying to climb a wall maybe you lost a, you dropped something while you were climbing uh, and and the sort of things or you you let something drop so there are traces that you 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 broke and entered in the place right. so uh it's nice to have games which are more leaning towards the sort of approaches because you experiment with them, you get familiar with them, and then when you play, you go back to another game, maybe something I could more traditional, then you are, you have this mindset that you can apply, which because mm -hmm. there's no reason you cannot apply, you know, skill check result in the end, I think, uh, like this. No, I absolutely agree. And again, this isn't a campaign game. Like this isn't going to take over your D&D game or your Pathfinder game or whatever. So you can experiment, and if it doesn't go well, it doesn't really matter. You know, you're going to laugh about it again. You're going to chalk it up to this being a bad movie and you're just still going to have fun with it and it'll, you'll be done. So that the consequences of trying something and it not working are so low 
that there's no real reason not to try. And if it works out great, again, you can take that skill to another game. And it, it's like a, there's a, like a no risk for effort and, and for trying here versus like if you play a campaign in a D&D &D or Call of Cthulhu or whatever, and you make a decision, you know, that could have ripple effects for a long time. If you're playing a long-term campaign, the risk of trying something new there might be more, uh, you might make more anxiety. There should be almost no anxiety here for this game. The, the GM role is spread out. The game does most of the heavy lifting for you. It should just be silly fun. And no matter good or bad, however it turns out, that's that's the point. And then you're you're done for the night. So just to clarify, uh, in the way the, the production functions, so you describe there's this action scene, there's a character, things happen. Actually, each player still plays different individual characters, right? They don't yes. narrate the same characters. Uh, right. So it's not like everyone is John sort of saying, but you could do that. Like the game could absolutely work if you, because a lot of action movies, you do have the lone hero. Um, so that's not the way the game is written currently, but there's nothing to say that you couldn't do that. Everybody has the same character and you just take turns. So like in our example of the car chase, what it might be is I, you know, I, I pull over, pull somebody out of their car and I get into it and I'm driving after the next person goes and they're like the eye in the sky and they're using satellites and like, Oh, there's a parade on the fifth. You got to make sure you go around it. And so them helping me navigate is how they help. And maybe there's another person on a motorcycle who's sort of trailing behind, keeping the thugs that are now chasing me because I'm chasing their boss from catching me. And that's how they're helping. So everyone has to figure out how their character is contributing to the overall success of the obstacle. And in some cases, like if it's a fight, then we're all fighting our own individual bad guys, or maybe we're all fighting the giant, you know, kaiju monster. We're all working the same thing, but each player kind of does their own thing, contributing to the success of the overall obstacle. And that's part of the fun too, is how do I, how do I help you be successful if that's the way the narration works? And I find fun in that sort of uh, problem solving. Like, how do I make this make sense? But each player's got a create a character for which yes. there they are stats uh, and so on. Yep. So but what what does a character actually uh, look like? What what defines a character in Action 12 cinema? So there's there's just a few different pieces to their elements, as I call them, to your character. So you got to have a name. Uh, you know, I, in the book, I list a lot of famous action movie names like John McClane and John Shepard and stuff like you would recognize from some American movies. But you can name them whatever you want. Uh, there's a place for the description, and it can be like I'm, um, you know, six foot tall, chiseled from Marvel, blue high, blue eyes, blonde hair, or it could be a man who's lost everything. Just something that kind of helps you picture in your head what this person looks like and kind of how they they feel. It's, it's totally up to you. But mechanically, you have attributes. There's four in the game: brains, brawn, charm, and moxie. Uh, so brains, pretty simple. It's how smart you are, how good you are at figuring things out, like how to interpret alien writing or ancient dialects or just chemical, you know, hacking computer stuff. Brawn is how strong you are, how good you are at fighting, uh, how tough you are. If you get like bit by a snake, do you fight off the poison? Charm is like social graces. Can you navigate political circles? Can you, you know, intimidate people? Can you manipulate people? Can you like watch and see who's actually the leader of a group of people who's pretending, you know, can you figure out who Sparta is basically? Um, and then Moxie is sort of a catch all It's supposed to be like luck or grit, but it's anything that's not brains, brawn, or charm. So if you're trying to figure out what you're doing and you're like, I don't really know what this is, it's probably moxie. So whenever you're doing something, you decide which of those attributes you're using. So if you're on a desert planet and there's a man in a green mask that jumps out behind a rock and you, you're you going to fight them, that's probably a bronze roll. Brawn, I should say. Um, if you're going to try to trick them, chase you so they fall into a pit, that's probably brains. It could also be charm. It could also be moxie. Like you you decide there's no GM, so you don't got to convince anybody. It's just kind of however you want to interpret. So that's your primary way to interact with the rules is you pick which attribute you're using. So like I'm driving through the city streets, that could be moxie. It could be brains. I'd, probably the two I would pick, but it could be something else. Um, then you have five skill slots. And you make up whatever skill you want. So you could say driving. And then anytime you're doing something in any sort of vehicle, you would get to use that ability. Um, I usually tell people to make at least one pretty broad. Uh, we played a game last night and I put space ninja. So anytime I had anything to do with space or being a ninja, I got to use the, the bonus. 
Uh, so, but they also can be fun to make them very specific, like underwater basket weaving. And then part of the fun is, can I narrate a scene in a way that me being good at underwater basket weaving is the perfect skill for this scene. So it makes sense that I can use it. You also don't have to make these up at the beginning. You can make them up during the game. That's a trope in action movies as well. It's like, oh, we need someone that can scuba dive. Oh, you didn't know I spent a summer scuba diving and you know, blah, blah, blah. So you can just make up skills as you need them. And you always start with one D12. If I didn't say this is a D12 base game, because that's the best die. Uh, once you pick your attribute, you're going to add a number of D12. When you use a skill, you're going to add a number of D12. And you're basically building a dice pool of D12s. You want to roll as many as possible. The most you can roll under normal circumstances is five. And then you just roll them and you're looking for ones are bad. Eights and above are good. Twelves are really good. And then you just kind of compare the numbers and you like three positives that helps you reduce your um, complication. 12s count as two successes and you get to do cool things with them. They're like a resource you can hoard and spend later. Uh, setbacks, if you get more setbacks than, than positive results, that is when you trigger another new obstacle or make the current one worse in some way. Uh, it's super simple. Like there's, there's very little mechanical heft to it. That's not what I'm trying to do. Are you familiar with the board game, The Mind, or the card game, The Mind? Yes, I am. I played a few sessions with uh, my mother and uh, and my brother, actually. So I equate my game to the mind. Because the first time I played the mind, I was both angry and impressed. Because it is just a deck of cards that goes 1 to 100. And whoever invented that game should be ashamed of themselves calling it a game because it's just a deck of cards that goes from 1 to 100. But it is so much fun. Because the way that they have you interact with that deck of cards that just goes one to a hundred, it's so much fun to play. So that's what Action 12 Cinema is. There's not a lot of mechanical depth to it. It's, it's a pretty simple system, but it does facilitate a way for you to interact with the other players and the rules that it just sort of facilitates fun, even though it's very simple. Again, that's it's not going to replace D&D. It's not going to replace Call of Cthulhu. Stop but saying it's, that. But it's not, because it's not supposed to. This game is for... Somebody can't show up tonight, but I don't want to cancel. Or I had a rough day at work and I, I don't have the brain wave to run my game, but I don't want to cancel. That's what this game is for. It fills that niche of a one shot where you just want to have a good time. There's no anxiety behind it. There's just like, let's have some fun. Let's make some, have some laughs. And the next week we'll go back to play our campaign. That's what this game is supposed to be. And, and I know that. Like, And I don't feel bad about saying it. It's a beer and pretzels game. It's a party game. It's absolutely just like a laugh factory game for or one night, four to five hours, and then you're done. I think as such, you know, and you know that, that's that's why I'm, you know, of course we we use different tropes uh, in Paris Gondo, the life swing magic of adventuring, but you know I find for the those sort of story game, uh, not story game in the sense of the the forge for for people who are really into game design, but uh, in the sense of uh, you know things like uh, uh, werewolves. Not not mm -hmm. the apocalypse of werewolves, the card game, and or uh, time stories, for instance. I think there's a space for the TTRPG enthusiasts to engage with a broader audience, and this sort of games are ideal for that. I think uh, things like Action Twelve Cinema are are, are things that that in a sense. Um, I think that they got the potential games like that, not specifically yours or mine. But games in that vein, uh, you mentioned Fiasco, for instance, there's a potential there to engage with an audience which is much broader than yeah. uh, <clears throat> the audience of uh, your D&D, your Pathfinder, and uh, you know all those games which even uh, require from you more more engagement, more availability, more time, and so on. So, and uh, yeah, Fiasco, for instance, we were talking about cards, no cards. Uh, it's in, and I know. I'm not announcing something. But, uh, there's a game called Lovecraft Task. Uh, you know, I've been talking with a, a number of designers of role-playing games who are now making deck of cards like Fiasco's Down mm -hmm. format role-playing game. So you don't even have a rule book at all. The, the cards are not... I mean, like For the Queen is an excellent example of that. Games which are formatted to appeal to, to people who show up in a board game cafe... And they can try this type of game. It's not a strategy game. It's not a competitive game. It's a story improv game. And uh, that's an opportunity for them to to do something uh, exciting and different. And maybe that's, you know, that's uh, that's something which might lead them to, to enjoy or not 
more complex type of uh, story games, which right. we call role playing games. Yeah, there. This is absolutely. A, if you are someone who like really just likes movies, like you're a movie person and you enjoy sort of the silly tropes that action movies lean into, and you've watched a ton of movies. You can play this game and have a lot of fun if you've never role played before, because you can just lean into the tropes of like, this is like this movie, or this is the, the silly thing from that movie, or, you know, this is my, my favorite type of trope in a, in, a, in a movie. You could play it from that angle, having no idea how role playing games work, and you'll still enjoy it. It really is a good mixture. Like I'm, other than role playing games, movies are probably my biggest hobby. Like I just love movies. I've been watching my whole life. Other than like, you know, eating and breathing and hanging out with my kids, movies are my second biggest hobby after role playing games. So this was a perfect combination for me of collaborative storytelling, the D12, which is again, the pinnacle, the polyhedral, the best die there is and movies. Sorry, particularly you, mispronounced bad ones. D, you mispronounced D10 again. I don't know why. No, no, no. no. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's the combination of those three things. D12s, bad, but fun action movies and collaborative storytelling. And those are my Three favorite things kind of shoved together into one game. So going back to movies and then you like movies, uh, tropes play an important part in the game. Uh, yes. Do they have a mechanical purpose or are they more like prompts to inspire you or does that work? Both. So we want to use tropes as often as possible because no good, bad action movie would exist without them. But at the start of the game, as part of the pre-production phase, you will generate one trope per player. So the game, I say it works best like three to five. I've played it with a few of two. I've, I know groups have played it with like eight or nine, like they did play tests. I don't, they had fun. That seems like a lot to me. So I'm going to tell you it's three to six. But for every player, you generate one trope. And you can use those tropes to give yourself a plus one to your die dice pool now most of the time you're going to max out at five because you're supposed to get to five but there are times when you just don't want to or the way the narrative has been built it doesn't make sense for you to use your best stuff so the tropes allow you to approach something in a suboptimal way but still get to the optimal dice pool so you're like okay i'm, I'm using my worst stat and i'm using my worst skill but I'm going to leverage this, this action movie trope and I'm still going to be able to roll enough dice that mathematically I'm still probably going to get the same number of successes I should. Uh, so if you, if you bring a trope into a scene, you get to add one D12 to your dice pool, but you should be doing that all the time. In between each act, we, we have a little like pause period where we kind of reset the story. You can change, um, you can add locations, you can change in uh, relationships. So like maybe we started off as rivals uh, because of what happened in act one, I'm going to say, well, now I actually consider you like a friend. So now in act two, we have a friendly relationship rather than an antagonistic one. And then for every trope that we used in act one, we will generate a new one. Or if we just don't like one, like we, we never found a way to use this trope. We don't think we're going to, I don't see it coming up in act three, we cross it out and we generate one to replace it. So there's, there's times throughout the game to add a new tropes. They're all randomly generated. There's over 250 common action movie tropes listed in the game. Uh, and you're free to add your own if you have your favorites that I didn't include. So uh, just reassure me that the following ones are included. Uh, are there among the troop a person talking weirdly over their shoulder? And also, <laughs> is there people traveling a seemingly long distance to have a brief conversation? I do not have those in there because I would consider those more dramatic tropes than action movie tropes. So we have things like enemies attacking one at a time, cool people don't look at explosions, never reloading your gun, uh, you know, literal cliffhanger, stop the things that you see in bad action movies all the time. Not good teen drama. I'm just waving a big thing for you to plug uh, Farm to Fable. Farm to Fable, the don't... best Smallville podcast that's not hosted by Tom Welling and Michael Rosenbaum. Yeah, I catch it every Tuesday. Farm to Fable, Smallville you know, fancast at Gmail. No, yeah. You know, podcasting Small, yeah. used to be a moms and pops, or rather pops and pops kind of business. And it's really unfair competition that actors, professional actors get involved to in that now. All yeah, right. Now that people find out you can't actually make money. Yeah. Well, they can. Uh, we can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We can. <laughs> they can. All right. Um, I saw you the uh, relations were mentioned also in the 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 draft Kickstarter page to which I, I got a private access to. Um or, or does that work? Is that the final mechanic that we, we we've not discussed yet today? 
So there's a couple others. There's some resources that will let you re-roll because you are supposed to be successful. You're action movie heroes. You're not really supposed to fail most of the time. Uh, so there's a way that you can re-roll. There's a way that you can get extra bonus dice above five on occasion. But the other big mechanic is your relationships. And the way this, those work is either that person is actually in the scene with you. So like say our characters like Hobbs and Shaw from the Hobbs and Shaw movie Fast and Furious, we're in the same scene together. We're both fighting the same person. I can leverage the fact that you're physically in the scene with, with me to get another die in my die pool. Or it could be like an emotional thing, like, damn it, I can't let my daughter down again. I will get through this terrorist group so I get to her dance recital. So that could spur you on to be more successful. So you have the option to, and it can be, again, it can be a rival. Like you don't, you want to show them up. You want to look better than them. So like a legless Gimli situation, or it could be romantic. Like I, you know, I got to save this. This is the love of my life. I can't let them die. So I have to be successful here. So it's just a way to, again, kind of get some comedy or dramatic tension going on in a scene when you can leverage the relationships. So right now, uh, people can already follow your Kickstarter page and uh, yep. the launch is planned for the end of the month. Yep. February 28th, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'm myself busy putting together the, the Kickstarter and so on. What's, uh, did you make any interesting discoveries in the process of putting this page together that uh, you did not realize just uh, interviewing other people about their Kickstarter. It's really hard. It is, it is really, <laughs> it is so hard. It's like, and it's a different skill set. Um, so it's like someone who writes novels saying, you know, writing a short story is actually harder than a novel to me or the other way around, because especially for the first time designer, like I, you know, people know me somewhat in the hobby. I'm a podcaster. Like I'm not a complete out of nowhere kind of person, but I've never made a game before. So I need enough detail to show that this is actually a game so that people can go, okay, I kind of see what the game is. I see how it would play, but you don't want to put the entire book because no one's going to read a 400 page Kickstarter page. So the balance of what to include, what not to include, where do you put art? How much art do you put in there? Uh, you know, what, where do you set your goal? Where do you set your levels? Like all of these are things that, you have to kind of figure out as you go, which is why I ended up partnering with Penny for a Tale. I don't know if I mentioned that or not. It's a, it, this is a group that has published other RPGs. They've hosted other Kickstarters. I've now hired them to help me. So I'm oh, not nice. just doing this by myself. So I do have someone in my corner that has done it before. So my levels are going to make sense. My, you know, I'm not going to get hosed on shipping. So it's not just me at this point. I have someone that's, that's helping in that, that part. Yeah, yeah February 28th, follow the Kickstarter support. Day one, super, again, I'll go on my soapbox. The way Kickstarter works, it's more important if someone jumps on, in on day one and pledges $1 than if they pledge $50 halfway through the campaign. Because a whole bunch of people day one showing up will push it up in the algorithm. It will get in front of other people and it's going to sort of snowball. So if you're thinking about supporting at all, and this is not just me, but any Kickstarter, do it as soon as you can. Your, you, your card doesn't get charged until the Kickstarter ends. So there really is no reason not to support early if you're going to support at all, especially for a small creator like me. Like if you're like, come on, minis, that they're going to hit $2 million before the campaign's over, probably doesn't matter as much. But for me, 10 people that show up on day one versus 10 people that don't, that could be a difference of $1,000 by the time the campaign's over. So please, 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 if you are thinking about supporting absolutely would love to have your support on day one as quickly as possible so that we can get that snowball roll. And I think we have a reasonable goal. I don't think it's, it's not very high. It's not, I'm not trying to set the world on fire. I'm just trying to cover my law, my expenses already cover my basics. And if it happens to catch in the algorithm, we're going to have a few fun stretch goals, but I'm not expecting that. Again, I could be wrong. I would love to be wrong. I'd love to, you know, hit a hundred thousand dollars, but uh, I don't think so. Yeah, and you know, uh, prepping for my own, I found out how much actually it's quite meaningful. Even if you just support a, a Kickstarter with a single dollar, uh, it's still quite meaningful, especially if so you're someone uh, who does a lot of Kickstarters and so on, uh, because people following you on Kickstarter will be informed that you supported a campaign. Uh, they won't mm -hmm. be told that it's for one dollar. So yeah, being there with your dollar, actually it's like, paying for advertisement, advertisement for, for the yeah. campaign and support and so on. And you, you get in the loop and you get informed of the, the campaign. So uh, it's absolutely uh, appropriate and meaningful to support 
you know, uh, I don't know if, yeah, pledge without reward. Uh, there's, there's, mm -hmm. it, it's already uh, at least uh, as far as I'm concerned for my own campaign. When once it will be live, uh, that's something uh, I, I will appreciate uh, very, very much. Uh, but uh, ambitions. Uh, you you mentioned you you try to be reasonable. Uh, you know, there's always the the funded goal. That's yeah. not the real goal, right? I mean, <laughs> that's no. the worst case scenario goal. <laughs> because if you're not funded, I guess nothing happens. What you invested into the campaign, you uh, quote lose it. Uh, yeah. Which 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 is a meaningful amount of money to be yeah. be clear. I, mean, I have like uh, I'm, a, I'm a, I have almost four thousand dollars out of my own pocket right now. Into yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, uh, I'm well. It's yeah for me it's a bit different because I uh, I've been selling a version of the game already, so I'm trying to mm -hmm. do things in a, a closed circuit, uh, not yeah. taking uh, too much at least from my personal savings try to it still happens but yeah for so i'm trying i'm trying to be very uh tight to my budget but yeah that's not about right but yeah worst case it's not the worst case scenario but if it's funded you got all the work you need to do to fulfill which which is fine but at the same time it, it's not it's it's usually in kickstarter what not what the actual goal is so yeah. what what uh, what are the stretch goals which you are very excited about about and really do hope to to unlock? And again, I, I have a show, if people aren't familiar, every other week I look at Kickstarters. Uh, now we've expanded to other things like Backerkit and Indiegogo and GoFundMe. But I look at a lot of crowdfunding campaigns all the time for the show that I do. And so while I'm no expert at it, I see a lot of them. I see what they're doing. I see the ones that I think are successful and you know ones that are not put together well. I am doing a very basic Kickstarter. Like I don't have a lot of stretch goals that are probably going to set the world on fire and cause someone to go, well, I was going to back at 20, but I'm going to make it 25 because I want to get, that's, I don't really have those. Um, we're not adding minis. We're not adding dice at certain levels. So really if we hit and we get a lot of money, I'm going to be able to pay the people who are helping me what they were worth. I'm like, I have bonuses built in that the people who paid, I, I bought art from, I'm going to go back and actually pay them more for the art they already gave me. And then I'm going to order more art to make the book prettier uh we might eventually switch to like color art if we get enough money it's going to pay for additional editing and that professional layout probably the biggest thing that i'm really hoping to hit is i want to have a stretch goal for digital tools um, i think you did that very well yourself with paris Gondo, mostly i think on your own i don't know if you hired someone to help you with like the you have like that whiteboard that you use and all the different cards and stuff right now i don't have any of that so when i run it online it is very here's what the character sheet looks like you need to write all this down on a piece of paper so i want to get some digital tools whether it's roll 20 character sheets or just like like a jot form or a whiteboard you know or was it jam board i think is the big thing people are using now to Miro make it is more... quite nice i recommend it it's quite straight what was that Miro is what Miro, I use yes. for free. Yeah. Uh, what what I see a lot of uh, people thinking it's quite important actually and doesn't have to cost anything. It's a character keeper, like just on a, a Google Doc spreadsheet, but pre-encoded mm. with yeah everything. Like uh, right at the moment, developing another game based on Brindlewood Bay. So the benefit is mm -hmm. that I could use as There's. the authorization, uh, but uh, someone voluntarily, I think did a character keeper for Brindlewood Bay, which is very complex with all the expansion and so on, and asked, can I draw inspiration from your thing? And that, yeah, the long story short, that's what I did. But right. yeah, uh, a spreadsheet character keeper, uh, it's something I, I would recommend definitely to do. And yeah. it doesn't have to cost. Uh, it doesn't have to cost a lot, but I want to pay some, because I yeah. don't have the skills to do it. So I'm going to pay someone to do that. So that's one of the stretch goals. But really, I just want to make the coolest looking book I can. I, the cover is awesome. I really love the cover. I've, I've had it. I got it way too early. I probably paid for the cover a year before I needed to. <laughs> I remember, um, yeah. The interior art, I'm loving it. So I just want to make the book as pretty as possible. It's a very bare bones Kickstarter. I don't have many rewards. Like there's there's the no re, you know no money or no reward backer level. There's PDF, PDF and a book. And then I have two that are kind of higher end if people just want to throw money at me. It's like a, an angel investor kind of pledge. You're just, you're still getting the same thing. Thing, but you know, maybe you get a little like a special thank you. You don't have so add-ons with a signature 
add-ons with you facilitating a session for them? I don't have any me facilitating. I do have a level where you pick a movie, any movie that you want. I will watch the movie and then I will personalize your copy based off the movie that I watch. Nice. So I will watch the movie and something in there will be like, oh, okay. And I'll be like, you know, someday you and I will swing over the pit of alligators and save the damsel sort of thing. No Akadekon uh, VIP treatment. None of that. Just because again, I don't want it to be too complex. I want it to be clean. It's my first game. Now, if this does go well and you know it hits a hundred thousand dollars, which it's not going to, but let's say it did, then yeah, I've got plans for other games. Maybe the next one will be a little bit more complex. But I I just want to I want this one to be successful. And I don't want to get in the situation where it's so successful that I then screw it up on the back end. Like, well, I've promised this and this and this and these. And now this game that was almost done it has to be completely rewritten and all these new rules have to be added. No, if it does really, really well, the people that I'm paying will get paid more. And I might actually pay myself back what I've got into it. Because that's not part of the goal right now. Is I have not taken any money. I don't have any plans of getting paid. I would like to pay myself back and then break even on everything else. That's that's my minimum goal. And um, as part of this break, e break even, I mean, uh, one thing I found out about uh in kickstarter uh is you know margins uh people might think margins are there mostly to to pay the designers and so on but before everything is shipped and fulfilled actually margins is your insurance policy to make sure that everybody that the thing will be fulfilled because you know yep. from advice i got was that um I don't remember but uh, uh, the the price of your book should be three to four times the or much cost. it costs you to produce because the idea is that worst case scenario if you lose half of your shipment you still have enough money in uh, your little war chest to pay for the new copies and ship them as replacement but that also means that hopefully uh, knock on wood when things do go well you, you do have a margins which come to you right uh and what i've seen is a lot of designers part of their goals of their kickstarter is not just to sell i don't know several hundred copies of the game through the kickstarter but it's also to print copies to sell afterwards at convention or to sell yeah. i don't know through indie press revolution for instance which uh, we had a, a, a great time selling paris gondo with uh, but what matters with something like Indie Press Revolution is that then shops, friendly local game stores are across the US and the world buy these copies and then sell them to, to more people. Uh, is is bringing the game to brick and mortar uh, shop yeah. part of your, your overall plan? Yes. Uh, so, you know, that's part of it as well as like, you know, if, if we end up paying for a hundred copies of the book, it's going to cost me X per copy. Mm -hmm. If we get 300 copies of the books, it'll be less than X. If I get a yeah. thousand copies of the book, it'd be like half of X. So, and then there'll be a point where let's say I say people pledge, I need to print 200. There'll be a part where maybe printing 300 costs the same as 200. You know, that, that there's a, there's a place where more, the discount you get for printing more equals out the cost. Don't um, forget you need to store them. <laughs> well, th th that's true. But, th but that is, we're going to hopefully print more than the pledge so that we will have extra. Cause I, you know, again, I run my own convention. So of course I can sell them at a catacon or I can give them away as prices. I go to a lot of conventions, so I might be able to, you know, they become marketing tools at that point. I maybe I give one away at every convention I go to type of a thing. So, and yeah, there's going to be a retailer tier where if, you know, if someone does want to buy five copies for their retail store, we'll sell them at a discounted rate, one bundle for shipping. We'll handle that after the Kickstarter. But like, I don't expect this to become my career. I'm still a hobby podcaster. I still have a, an actual job. My wife makes decent money, which helps pay our bills. So this isn't like my livelihood is not going to be this. So I'm not going to have to be scrambling every moment to, you know, if I get five more stores to sell my game, I can X, no, this is all just fun for me. And I want to keep it that way. So if it, if it goes well, it's just great. I'm going to have the time of my life, but my insurance policy is that I don't lose my, lose money on this process. So all my math is based off of not losing anything, not gaining stuff, if that makes sense. But yeah, I would love to see this in every game store. I'd love to see this in, you know, Gen Con, uh, dealer hall like i'd love to be able to walk up and go hey do you mind if i sign that copy of the book because i wrote it you know that that's 
that's going to put the biggest smile on my face that will never come off. Brilliant. Have you had that yet, by the way? Have you just gone into a game store and your game been there that you didn't put it there? No, 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 oh. no not this way. But uh, it's already been a great pleasure. I, I, I keep a, a close check. So again, uh, um, uh, I got in touch with Indie Press Revolution at some point because I told they, they would be attending UK Games Expo. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, one thing led to another. I did was invited by them to send them copies of the game, which then they, they started selling uh, to anyone who goes to Indie Press Revolution. It's out of stock right now. Uh, I, I yeah, my journey is slightly different because and uh, I sold a version of the game before starting the Kickstarter, so the Kickstarter would be an improved version. But um, especially as someone in the UK, not in the US, in terms of fulfillment and management, shipping and all of that, uh, that was I learned a lot of very important. Uh, listen, but uh, long story short, uh, True Indie Press Revolution was a, a stockist, uh, and they, they do special discounts for retailers, uh, so that the retailers can sell copies at the same, you know, uh, end price as everybody else. Right. They sold copies to different shops across the U.S., including one in the U.K. Also, one in the U.K. And uh, through them, uh, well, because you know, you got the data of that. I kept a, an eye on this, so and googling stuff uh, around, I found out <clears throat> which shops across the US uh, got copies of Paris Gondo, and I was extremely happy just just to be aware of that. Right. And then I'm very <laughs> lucky <laughs> to have uh, a couple people at the RPG Academy, uh, especially Tom, who apparently is uh, very keen to have excuses to visit random friendly lo local game stores, who went and uh, took pictures of Paris Gondo in the wild, uh, but not randomly, just <laughs> on my hey, uh, it turns out that uh, this shop in uh, Cincinnati, I think it's Woodburn Games. Woodburn Games, uh, yeah. Uh, they, they got copies, uh, and, uh, and Tom went and took a picture of it, and another member of the Academy went there afterwards and bought the copy so so that's how yeah so far that, that's been my experience i haven't i haven't yeah it's it's really weird i was making the math recently and apparently there have been there's 175 copies of paris gondo out there uh, i don't remember when and how i sold half of them i was very <laughs> surprised by this number but uh that includes 80 copies at uh, via indie press revolution uh in into different shops so 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 yeah i mean sending to the us and since i'm not a us citizen and uh work has not taken me there for quite a while now uh the, the chances of seeing there in the, in the wild uh, are quite slim i uh, here in london there's leisure games who, who took copies and who attend conventions so through them uh, it's likely i will run into a copy but uh yeah i, I haven't visited a shop and there it was it's more uh you know uh, that's 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 actually my main goal with the kickstarter my game exists um but right now it's got cards and so on dry erase pen tokens which is a bit difficult and yep. in terms uh, the most difficult bit is the packaging so you know mm -hmm. having a nice custom box with the logo of the game uh it's it's expensive at a small scale so yep. uh the, the really the big issue as a self published person is i think i could sell i don't know 300 copies of paris gondo i think that's that's something which would be you know a reasonable goal through in the press revolution leisure games and my own me going to convention and so on it might take a while but 300 copies could be fine but the thing especially if i had a nice box for paris gondo but the reality is that i cannot afford to pay up front right for what it cost i uh you know uh full disclosure they ran out of stock at indie press revolution of paris gondo and well first of all when indie press revolution asked me to get the game they asked me oh can we have 80 copies and i was like i don't have 80 copies i got I got I got fifty left, and say okay, we'll take them. But I had to because it's a stockist. They didn't buy the copy, uh, which is normal. I had to ship them to the US, which and yeah. and then it was there. And once it's paid on a quarterly basis, I get the money out of the sale. Right. But 
I had to pay for printing and so on. And in January, they ran out of copies at Indie Press Revolution. And I received a little... Which is a good problem to have. It's a good problem than... to have. Right. But I was like, all right. And they asked me for 80 copies again. And I was like, okay, actually, I got just in my the you know my little war chest money which I set aside for for all the the game design stuff I just just enough money to print those copies with everything the tokens and so on and ship them uh, I need confirmation on the cost of shipping them to in the press revolution but that's it right now I'm at zero mm -hmm. like I would have to take on my family savings to pay the upfront cost for going to Yuki Games Expo. But that was a decision because I was like, oh, actually, I was not planning on printing this version of Paris Gondo before the Kickstarter. I told, that's it. That's what I sell. And then that's it. But I was like, yeah. Uh, so the reality is I'm at zero uh, in April, which is the next time I'm going to be paid. I might have 200 pounds. Right. And if I sell all those 80 copies somehow, first of all, if I manage to ship them as fast as possible to Indie Press Revolution and manage to ship them, I might be back with, with more money, which would be useful then. But right. the reality is that that money will be less useful then than it would be for me right now to pay for, exactly. yep. for a number of things. And it's, at the same time, I was a bit like, do I print those copies? Will they be sold before the Kickstarter is really full in motion? To be mm -hmm. fair, even if the Kickstarter is in is this summer, that doesn't mean that the new version of the game will be available in the hands of people before a year later, pretty sooner. But uh, let's say worst case scenario, a year later, so people could still play the the current version for quite a long time before before the new one is available. But more importantly for me, especially now that Twitter is a mess, all the social <laughs> media are a mess, really. They, yeah. I find it's very difficult to promote anything compared to when I started the podcast. It's really not the same environment to, to get yourself out there. I really think that having those 80 copies in stores across the US with shops who bought that copy at a discount but their job is, and their, their, their ambition and their, their pleasure is to, their enthusiasm is to have Paris Gondo and being like, oh, we want to sell that one copy. We have those two copies to more people. That's actually the real promotion mm -hmm. of the upcoming Kickstarter because the best promotion of the game, I think, is playing the game. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I go to convention and I run demonstration online and so on. So that's, that's actually, rather than spend 800 pounds, in um in facebook ads like we were discussing about it spending 500 dollars in facebook ads i think it's a better investment for me to to send them those physical copies but i don't know <laughs> right like this summer. exactly you don't exactly know it's it's sort of a best guess situation so i, I will kind of circle back to say that i have had the opportunity to play this game a couple of times on podcasts and streams so if if i didn't do a good job selling it or someone still doesn't understand what we're talking about uh there are a couple actual plays out there there will be more coming uh there's a podcast version on tabletop journeys that you can listen to it was a three episode series i thought i thought that was a great example of that game we did a stream on Rook and Rasp. Uh, that was a little bit earlier. That was the oldest one we've done. So there's been some changes since then, but it's still a, pr a pretty good representation. I did a stream last week on a Geek of One's Own stream that's out there. We're going to have one on our channel. So there are some places out there that you can go and watch the game being played to see, oh, this does seem like fun or, or no, this isn't for me. It, you know, you do have a chance to kind of see what it is before you would have to pledge, but please pledge. What about show and tell? Uh, RPG we, Academy we trial were, of crowdfunding. Yeah, <laughs> we're you... doing that. So I, I recorded show and tell today. We're going to do a sample adventure uh, that will coincide with the launch of the Kickstarter. And uh, we've already touched on it a couple of times on Econ Fundamentals, but uh, it hasn't been live yet. But there's, there's definitely good. If you, the thing is, it, we're only touching people who already know me. Like anyone who will, who will be inspired by any of those already knows everything about it so we're kind of preaching well, to the choir you never well. know you know even even podcast stuff you you're surprised sometimes you know you know i try to be very proactive with promotion and I, i'm still astounded when i run to into people i know and i'm like huh 
I didn't know you're designing a game and you're like, <laughs> really? <laughs> so I I don't think there's no, you never know. You know, you might have yeah. people who only lis listen to econ fundamentals, people who listen just to uh, sample adventures or, you know, so yeah, it doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah again, if only one person, like I, we ran, a, I, I played a game last night it wasn't for the stream and two people were like, yeah, I'm going to buy this game now. So like every time I run it, I almost always guaranteed one person's going to come away going, okay, this is cool. I want to back up. So every time I run it, it's, it's one or two people. I just got to run it a million times. I know. Right. I, I played mine six, 60 times now. Uh, so that's why we designed no prep games. Yes. <laughs> my, my, exactly my next it. game is with prep. But I, I will recycle a lot of prep. Oh. But uh, when I when I was uh, demonstrating Paris Gondo, I'm like, this is really nice that I designed a game which requires absolutely no work whatsoever, and that I can even facilitate because it's it's GM less. So I facilitate it, but nowadays I I don't even play it. I'm just like mm -hmm. go there, just ask a few leading questions, and then stand back in my chair and uh, enjoy other people playing it. But um, that's for that's the advice for to designers out there. Design a game which is really easy to run because when you run demonstration, it will play in your favor. Yes, 100% 100, 100 on that. So uh, yeah, once again, thank you, Kiln, for having me on, man. I really appreciate your time. And again, I, I do count Paris Gondo as an inspiration to what I'm doing. I hope I can equal at least, you know, your success. Uh, we, we went different avenues because I didn't do the itch thing first. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but please, anyone listening, uh, I'm, I'm assuming there'll be links in your show notes for the Kickstarter. Uh, you can do the thing where notify me on launch. So if this goes out before the 28th, uh, I'd love to have some people check it out and hopefully support me. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Michael. And uh, uh, good speed with, uh, with your campaign. Uh, you. I'm in the background taking notes like, oh, that's how we did it. Did it work? Uh, <laughs> we'll uh, find out. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, kind of. Okay. <laughs> you, are, you are my canary in, down the mine. So it, Happy it, happy to be that. For you, sir. <laughs> Please. It would be nice if it didn't go terribly wrong, just for my own sake. Uh, I, would, yeah. I would appreciate it. You know, don't, don't. <clears throat> shouldn't be saying that, but please don't make the reputation of podcasters designing games worse. <laughs> <It's right>. <laughs> All right. We will be the, the trendsetters, the pioneers that change that. Oh, pretty. Yeah. 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 That's uh that's, that's a big hope. Sorry. I can say that because people can go check my Kickstarter profile and they will, f they will realize what was the first Kickstarter ever. I support it. <laughs> and, mm. And and, well, and that's yeah. it. I will uh, guarantee you, people will get something from me. There will absolutely be a product delivered. It may not be as pretty as I hope it will be, but you'll get something you can play. <laughs> no, uh, at least you got a nice cover. The cover is there, so it's the fine. So it's, great. So it's not like you need to draw the the, the cover art yourself with a big yeah. stiff pen. So uh, at least you've got a a, bri a brilliant uh, cover uh, already. So so that's fine. Uh, maybe the the binding won't work. The the pages will fall <laughs> off. Uh, yeah. or something like that but uh, otherwise uh, otherwise it's fine thank you my uh, thank you so much michael and uh, yeah people uh, please do rush hit that uh, get me notified when it starts or if you're listening this later go uh, support the kickstarter straight away or if you're listening to this uh, later head to uh, whatever uh, it's called back a kit uh, to uh, have late pledges uh, and so on and go check uh, all of michael's shows on the rpg academy and including Farm to Fable. Yes, and film studies. Don't forget that one. That'd be a that'd be a tragedy to leave that one off the list. Yeah, no one ever ever knows when one episode gets released though. But uh yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Michael. Thanks everyone for listening. Cheers. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye.